Welcome to Psychologist Talks. Today's episode is going to be the second in a series about borderline personality disorder. And today's episode is going to be about subtypes. Now, the way, the reason why I say that somewhat coyly is if you watched or listened to episode one, I said, I don't know about that subtype thing. Then I go looking around and lo and behold, there's research out there on subtypes. However, uh, you know, when I, you know, look at psychodynamic theory, I, I don't happen upon a lot of subtypes. And if I had to take a guess after looking at the research, the reason why is there's not a lot of agreement about what subtypes really are. You Google this and they'll be firmly, oh, it's very commonly known that there's these subtypes. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> so I'm going to traverse these, uh, the, the, the structure, basically, I'm going to go through what I found online. First, Google, just in general. Second, research. Now, do note, this is not going to be like massively exhaustive. I did not spend weeks and months uh, researching this. Who knows? Maybe I'll come back and make a version two of this after I learn more about them. But then I'm going to try to consolidate and offer my thoughts. Uh, kind of applying my knowledge to the research that I found. And we'll kind of talk about implications of that. So let's start with what I found online, then research, then we'll go through uh, what I think. Um, the online one, you, some of the ones that came up, remember, you got to be careful of uh, algorithms with Google, but what came up was not bad. Uh, one of the top search results talked about four <laughs> different types. Um, Discouraged, impulsive, petulant, and self-destructive. All right, taking a glimpse at these, I was like, well, all right, makes some intuitive sense. Discouraged in particular, I like a lot. And we're going to revisit this because I think you know, there's a lot of common themes across several of these. And the discouraged makes good sense uh, because it's a more internalizing type. Internalizing is like taking emotion and experience and it, it lives inside of oneself versus gets expelled or, or pushed out through behavior, obvious observable things. And this, this creates more allowances for more depressed and anxious iterations of borderline personality disorder, which I have long observed and long wondered about. Uh, there was even a time when I wondered if there was like a dependent subtype the borderline personality disorder because dependency is often colored by a more depressive and anxious presentation amidst the relational insecurity and fears of abandonment. And so this lines up very well. Another cool way to think of it, if you, uh, you know, not the, the other most popular, or I should, who knows with antisocial, but to me, one of the other most popular is that I already did narcissism. It talks about covert narcissism. And perhaps this is the more covert versions of borderline personality disorder because they're not as externalizing. You're not going to see the prototypical, you know, walking on eggshells causing type of behavior uh, that you would see in the, again, more prototypical. So maybe this whole discouraged, quiet, covert thing is plausible. Sure. Impulsive, and then I'll jump to the, the second one. Self-destructive is kind of curious to me because they feel kind of similar and what you'll hear me talk about is they both feel kind of externalizing. And the difference is likely the addition of self-destructive, self-harm behavior, whereas the impulsive is more like dysregulated in general. The self-destructive adds that extra self-destructive component because impulsive behavior can be inadvertently self-destructive. Self-destructive subtype, I'm guessing, is more like uh -uh, self-harm, risk. I am going to burn my own bridges down. And there is a degree of intentionality to it, although we gotta be careful because self, self-defeating aspects of personality are often unconscious. I digress. The fourth one was petulant. Eh, feels a little bit more on the side of like uh, affective instability. Uh, and there's a relational component to it. I mean, think about the word petulance. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of like they're not fun as partners because there might be manipulation or, or they're so reactive and, and they're, they're creating eggshells, if you will. Uh, and, and perhaps that's what the alleged petulant subtype is. I don't know. But it feels like it's missing or it's just it doesn't feel sufficiently distinct uh, to me. But before we get into too much of what I think, I'll go into some other research. Now, note that this research, the stuff I was pulling up, is all 2000 and beyond. And it's super interesting because the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual uh, looks at a lot of research before then. I'm, you know, I'm not seeing too, too many subtypes in the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual. And we'll get into, I think, a little bit why. 
Well, let me just kind of laundry list these. Um, there's one that, that really interestingly focused a lot on the presence or absence of anger. And I think there was one or two others that also did this. And I really like that because if you remember from episode one, I talked a lot about the pivotal role of anger and especially the word hostility. Hostility directed outward versus hostility directed inward. How present is hostility? And so they said there's an angry slash aggressive subtype, an angry slash mistrustful mistrustful being that kind of more relational paranoia, poor identity slash low anger, which is kind of interesting, and then also a prototypical type. Another one that comes kind of similar to that, they talked about like there being a high functioning. I always like that because that talks about the organizational level that I yeah, reference in, and I'll reference again today, but I referenced in the reconceptualizing personality episode. They talk about like high functioning, but then there's aggressive non-paranoid and then non-aggressive paranoid. This one's super cool because that relational paranoia, I often I often have a hard time categorizing like where do you put paranoia? Is it more internalizing or externalizing? I always wondered, you know, it feels a little bit more internalizing. It's often just kind of living in one's own head and turning over and with anxiety and fear. But there can be more aggressive, hostile versions of paranoia. Well, these particular researchers, which I should note include Kernberg, Otto Kernberg, the, I think the other person who should be more famous for borderline personality disorder than Marsha Linehan, who deserves all the credit in the world, but <laughs> it's more than just Linehan out there. I like it. I, I like it a good amount because it talks about almost like a yin and a yang but between a more internalizing paranoid and externalizing hostile aggressive, as well as high functioning. Another one says high functioning, but then it says, well, there's a more histrionic version, um, a more depressive version, and then a more depressive internalizing and a more angry externalizing. But you'll notice there's that kind of common theme, more angry externalizing, internalizing, high functioning. There's another one that even said like, well, let's correlate it with other personalities. One's like an avoidant obsessive compulsive. The, obs the obsessive compulsive personality overlay is really interesting. Uh, paranoid slash schizotypal. Schizotypy, I'll, I'll, I'll eventually tackle that one. Highly misunderstood, but it's basically atypicality, reality testing issues is what I think they're going for here. And then even the histrionic narcissistic type. Another one that Divides into three, affective dysregulation, rejection sensitivity, and mentalization failure. If you remember from episode one, I talked about issues and deficits in mentalization and metacognition. Really cool addition. There's another one that talks about like there being a core, that more prototypical BPD. Then it talks about extrovert. I don't know about that. And externalizing. Ah, there it is again. Then they talk about a schizotypal slash paranoid, which I'm like, uh, where'd the internalizing go? Is that feels like an oversimplification but you'll again see that common theme. So if you didn't, your eyes are, you didn't gloss over listening to all of that, you're like, holy cow, what do I do with any of that? Or, or, you know, maybe I went through them too quickly. I'll try to synthesize the best I can. You know, this is not a meta-analytic meta study, so, so, you know, bear that in mind. This is me imposing my opinion and, you know, my, my experience and, and knowledge onto this as well as basically just counting because if you count them anger and paranoia were top in the list i mean they were cropping up all over the place so there's got to be something going on that 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 suggests that these are two really important variables to look at and it's right there in the diagnostic criteria hostility you know as anger slash what i you know really emphasize is hostility and then the relational insecurity aka paranoia so it makes good sense that a lot of these subtypes are saying how inflamed or how primary are those two factors. And I, I think that's very sensible. And then there, you can almost kind of collapse a lot of the other ones, which is maybe a dangerous thing to do, but the more depressive internalizing. So not just the relational paranoia, but like the really anxious, depressive, more internalizing, more invisible, covert which could also possibly uh, be seen as higher functioning. Now I say that delicately, because <laughs> I think it's a little bit bold to presume that, you know, the presence of hostility and or relational, high levels of relational paranoia are solely indicative of lower levels of organization using psychodynamic language, like lower functioning essentially. Because, you know, I can think of some internalizing folks that are pretty self-destructive um, and very challenging to move in treatment. 
But, you know, it's kind of an interesting notion that there's a more covert version and then maybe a more relationally paranoid version and then perhaps there's a more aggressive, hostile, externalizing version. Now, don't take my word for that. That's just me kind of postulating and I'm not really wed to anything yet looking at all this stuff. But, you know, it makes some intuitive sense. When I apply then, so let's get to this next section. When I apply... What I know about psychodynamic theory to all of this, I go, okay. <laughs> One, why did they not explicitly note um, the subtypes? Um, perhaps because there's so much diffusion in the field, there's not really agreement. Um, but, you know, they provide a model, going back to the rethinking personality episode, they provide a model for organizational level. And within organizational level, it captures, I think, um, aspects of functioning that I think are really important and can differentiate a few things, particularly like paranoia, aspects of dissociation. Um, I, I will I will know, maybe there's a fourth type. There's the internalizing, but more like affectively inclined. There's also, I think, internalizing with higher dissociative components, but even then it just gets messy. I can even contradict myself thinking of an opposite example. All right, I'm just gonna give up and keep going. So first let's do a history lesson here. Now, I'm pretty sure I'm accurate on this. I, I, some, I screw up my facts sometimes since I don't, you know, spend weeks. This is not my primary job creating an episode. But I'm pretty sure organizational levels and the organizational level that if you haven't watched the episode, let me go through it real quick. Healthy, quote unquote, healthy, um, neurotic, borderline and psychotic. And I'm pretty sure, pretty sure <laughs> borderline level of organization predates borderline personality disorder. Um, the theory of borderline organization predates the diagnosis, the diagnostic, diagnostic category of borderline personality disorder. And so I wonder if that's kind of part of what's going on here. Uh, borderline levels of organization are, are the border of a more neurotic, kind of more uh, narrow focus areas of problem versus psychotic, which is high levels of disorganization and pervasive issues. It's on the cusp, it's on the border. That's the whole purpose of that. And I, you know, to this day that you can still have borderline levels of organization for almost any personality. It's basically just says like functionally, how are they doing? You know, how pervasive, how rigid, how many domains um, are being impacted? And at the borderline level, it's amping up quite a bit, but not as, um, not as far reaching and, and encompassing as a psychotic level of organization would be. Over time though, they realized that, that you know, a lot of people falling into the borderline level of organization actually had their own distinct, unique presentation that there's a ton of overlap between these two, that the borderline level of organization is in many ways indicative of a lot of signs of disorganization that you see in borderline personality disorder. Um, and so this might be why uh, that, that there's there's less distinction on subtypes is because, well, birthed out of organizational level, basically. Uh, and so, you know, <laughs> prototypical borderline personality disorder is indeed in the borderline range functioning. It, it is rare to see, uh, you know, very distinctly a neurotic level because of the nature of the diagnostic criteria. They're so it's so kind of far reaching between emotion, behavior, and relational dysfunction. It's hard to envision or imagine a more neurotic level. Although I guarantee you they exist. Uh, these are individuals who. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. Are probably more internalizing in nature because you're going to see less behavioral dysregulation and less emotional dysregulation. It's not that there isn't dysregulation on an internal sense, because there could still be a ton of emotional chaos on the inside. It's just you might not see it because they obscure it. They, they create a defense system around it. And they might have healthier attachments, and, and you know we get into the causes of it in episode three, but uh, biological, less pri biological predispositions. And so they obscure that a little bit better. Um, Neurotic levels also, the hostility is more likely to come across probably as passive aggressive or the threshold, the distress tolerance is much higher. So the threshold uh, for, you know, the, the, you know, outbursts is also much higher. It takes a lot more before they boom, it hits. And I mean, the lightning can still strike, <laughs> 
but it takes more before they get to that level. And uh, excuse me, sorry, I itch on my nose, but it, it, you know, you, you also might see more prescriptive issues. One might be a little bit more impulsive or one might be a little bit more relationally paranoid. Notice what we're talking about with the subtype stuff, right? Um, that, that maybe is what you see at this higher level of organization. You get to the mid-level, the borderline level, you start to see dysregulation in all areas. And very interestingly and very importantly, you start to see more reality testing, testing issues. You start to see more issues also with metacognition. Uh, kind of understanding and thinking about thinking. There's more attributional errors made and thereby paranoia begins to set in. And this is universal. You can go to other diagnoses and argue the same, that reality testing exists on a continuum and those issues begin to amplify as this sort of hypothetical organizational level goes down. And as you get to the lower rungs of the borderline level of organization for borderline personality disorder, you start to see psychoticism, more overt, delusional-like thought or errant, uh, you know, uh, psychotic experiences like we were talking about um, in, in episode one, these kind of transient or errant like voice hearing or whatever it might be. You start to see that more as well as absolute wild vacillations between extremes as well as high levels of impulsivity, sudden and impulsive self-harm, which puts them very much at risk for actual completion of suicide, et cetera, et cetera. These are extremely hard cases and usually require treatment teams to really effectively treat the people organized at that low of uh, organizational level because it's just absolute chaos, tons of hospitalization, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll notice though in that it captures some of these prospective subtypes. We're basically talking about potential subtypes as you move through the organizational level. There's a more prototypical, then there's a more dysregulated or paranoid built in. The other argument, it's a little bit of a false dichotomy. It's a little bit of a, a oversimplification is simply just differentiating between more internalizing versus externalizing. I mean, when you, when you look at like the core kind of understanding of borderline personality disorder is they, they, they have their feet in two spaces at the same time. They are both wildly in the internalizing world and wildly in the externalizing world. And that's your prototype. And so wouldn't it make sense that, that you know, the prototype is a vacillation, a rapid vacillation between those two, a really lack of balance between those two. It would be plausible that some subtypes lean more towards internalizing and sub subtypes lean more towards externalizing. And you could arguably apply this to a lot of different diagnoses too. I mean, one of my, you know, kind of pulling from the psychodynamic manual is basically saying that you've got organizational level, then you got internalizing or externalizing, or psychodynamic terms talk about the. Um, was the introjective and the analytic? You know, it's not quite the same as internalizing and externalizing. But for simplicity's sake, I'll keep it to internalizing and externalizing. So think about that. What do you think the internalizing type looks like? Kind of already alluded to this, right? More depressively inclined, more anxiously inclined, more worried. You're not going to see these things externally. Probably less impulsive. Uh, the relational paranoia might very much be there that they are stuck in their own heads and they are turning things over and over and over and over again and they're more passive and perhaps more submissive they might be more self-destructive in quiet ways rather than the overt more histrionic more obvious ways and that makes good sense to me you know there's still kind of sub areas in there. It'd be good to differentiate, like are they more relationally paranoid or is it more of like a self-worth issue or is it a mood regulation issue? Like where do you start? But if you're gonna be diagnosing borderline personality disorder, there's probably a smattering of all. It's just, you know, maybe what do they lead with? You start moving to the externalizing type, remembering that they, the, the poles still exist. It's just to what degree there's a, there's a leaning or there's a greater percentage is not 50 50 not that anything's 50 50 but you know you know that, that sort of look at the normal curve you've got the prototypes and you've got the internalizing and externalizing you know heavier leaners we just went through the internalizing externalizing what do you think more impulsive probably a lot more hostility a lot more aggression a lot more self-destructive behavior that is like boom public out there visible even possibly more manipulative, especially the further you move down that pole. 
uh, I'm trying to think substance use is probably more uh, prevalent there. At least, especially the more uh, uppers of the world, the, you know, the, or the more illicit that you have to go through illegal means to acquire. Um, I'm trying to think, I feel like I'm missing something obvious here. And the relational paranoia might be more aggressive too therein. You know, it's not just like fear and worry and, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'm going to look on the phone and I'm going to test and, you know, try not to rock the boat too much, but just enough and maybe some passive aggressive jabs. Uh, it's going to be like in your face, like burn it down. <laughs> I mean, you know, just you're the best thing ever, then boom, punch right to the face. And I'm trying to make a joke because that could be literal, uh, more often figurative, but, you know, punch to the face literal, literally or figuratively. Um, and that's that more externalizing type. And, you know, I don't know, this makes sense to me. Um, a lot of personalities exist on these continuums. Uh, and if you even think back to the narcissistic, uh, assuming you've watched or listened to it, if you were to look uh, or watch at the, the, the narcissistic subtype episode, they talk about the more covert versus the more overt. Like, are we just saying internalizing versus more externalizing? Hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, I think that's a safe way to be curious about it. Like, don't anchor in anything. Like, if I had to, in closing, say there's a ton of subtypes out there, it seems. And there's not really agreement around it, as far as I can tell. And so you can look those up, but be cautious. Really be cautious. I mean, I said this even with more established subtypes around narcissism. Still be careful. Like, don't diagnose yourself. Don't <laughs> diagnose other people. And do not anchor your own identity if you're diagnosed with one of these in this, like, oh, clearly I'm 100% this subtype. Think of it more of like, wh what do I lead with? Maybe some of these things are alluring to you, but if it feels overwhelming, I would argue, focus more on the internalizing versus externalizing. It's a good way to convey yourself too, of like, what are your difficulties uh, to a provider, to a therapist? It's like, well, I have these... You know, say if you're diagnosed or you're worried that you're diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, you could be. Like I have this intense emotional world that, that feels like it's pulled between the extremes, this sort of violence and aggression and, and uh, towards others, but also myself. And I seem to lean more on the myself side as a part of me that like disavows and just feels super uncomfortable with the idea of anger. You're probably more on the internalizing type. Or I have been told and people seem pretty scared of me and my emotions. You might be leaning a little bit more on the externalizing side. And it just gives you sort of a greater nuance to your unique difficulties. Uh, and then you and your providers can explore that further and really get the more functional problems and what's really truly unique to you. Strengths included. Strengths included. So I don't know if that's helpful. And, and it, should I apply organizational level to myself? Uh, it's a, it can be highly stigmatizing. It's not meant to be because as I talk about the, in the reconceptualizing episode, it's meant to be kind of freeing. Like, hey, you know, there's fluidity here and it helps me understand as a provider, like what depth of treatment are, you know, or what type of treatment might we start with. You're welcome to be curious about that. As long as you're willing to not damn yourself being curious about that. I think the one that's easier to be curious about, safer to be curious about, is the internalizing versus externalizing, or just kind of looking around and seeing what other people seem to think are subtypes out there. Just, again, be careful of anchoring and be careful of self-judgment. So that is what I found. Again, my apologies. This is not an area of expertise for me, apparently, as far as subtypes go. I was not aware, but that's based on the research I did and, and what I would personally recommend and, and what makes good sense to me. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's worth recapping. That kind of anger, paranoia, identity, emotionality, but at the end of the day, internalizing and externalizing feels the, the simpler of the two. So, Alrighty, well, uh, if, if everything's on track, the, the next planned episode is going to be on development, which is its own really interesting and equally complex <laughs> episode. So uh, I hope this has been interesting and, and helpful and curiosity-provoking as ever. And, uh, well, as ever, stay curious. Thanks so much.